Okay. okay, so last time we talked about class one malocclusion and uh, we talked about the different uh, definitions and terminologies related to class one. Are you Yeah. Right. We have on the etiology of class one will include the features, but then he is in a way to problem list. The treatment objectives with treatment plan. تمام. وبلشنا نحكي عن special clinical cases. هلا لما أحكي عن special clinical cases مش معناته إنه هدول موجودين بس في class one. لا طبعا. The crowding, the spacing, so what generalized, the localized, the displaced teeth, the vertical discrepancy. كل هدول كل هدول ممكن يتواجدوا في other types of malocclusions. بس لأن class one until the posteriorly almost average normal فأسهل إن نركز على one problem. إذا بلشنا نحكي كلاس 2 ديفيجن 1 حنبلش نحكي على الأشياء الثانية، فبلاش نخلي المواضيع سهلة هلا وبعدين نبلش نركز على الأذر تايبس اوف مال بروجيكتس. فلاست تايم وي توكت أباوت كراودينغ، المرة هاي رح نحكي عن السبيسينغ. هلا السبيسينغ ممكن يكون جنرالايزد أو لوكاليزد. كيف بعرف؟ بتطلع على الستادي موديل وبعمل سبيس أناليسيز. إذا طلع عندي ماينس معناته كراودينغ، إذا طلع عندي بلس معناته سبيسينغ. تمام؟ هلا الجنرالايزد سبيسينغ is is a bit of burden in terms of orthodontic treatments is difficult to treat لأن retention difficult or relapse is sometimes dominant. فالواحد بدي يفكر بالنهاية قبل ما يفكر إيش بدي يعمل. At the end, retention مهم صح؟ It's an important part of treatment. إذا كان retention إذا كان the case prone to relapse ما نعطي the case difficult. هلا السبب أهم أسباب ال generalized spacing اللي هو tooth size partially discrepancy related to small teeth اللي هو microdontia. أو مسكتي اللي هو هاي بدانشي. زي ما حكينا it is difficult لأنه في عنا relapse. هلا بال mild cases we encourage the patient to accept. ما في داعي نعمل orthodontic treatment. بال moderate cases إذا كانوا الاثنان شوية microdontia صغار نسبيا بالنسبة لوجه ال 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 patients وحجم بقية الاستان إلى آخره then we can suggest إنه نعمل Aesthetic product, veneers, composites, crowns, accordingly. And if it's severe, for most probably we'll have to go with orthodontic treatment plus restorative uh, treatment. So with orthodontics, we close some spaces, we localize other spaces, and then we think of aesthetic replacement. So like an implant, a bridge, text removable, auto transplantation. To replace uh, the uh, or to, to camouflage the spacing. Like this case here, for example, we have mild spacing. It does not really affect patient's aesthetics, so we encourage the patient to accept. accept. So we go with accept. This patient here almost the same amount of spacing, but it does affect aesthetic and it does affect function. So actually, here we offer the patient treatment, mild. We look at the size of the teeth, they look normal, so we don't offer restorative treatment because the size is good. So we go with fixed appliance, alignment level, closed spaces. So just close spaces and think about retention carefully. Case, severe cases, I'm oh, sorry, moderate cases where we have spacing that affects aesthetic. Again, teeth are acceptable, but laterals are small, so we can offer the patient Build up with laterals plus closing the spaces with orthodontic treatment. The patient was, was happy with very small laterals, so we just went with orthodontic treatment only. Now, here are severe cases where we have microdontia in addition to hyperdontia, where we have congenitally missing central incisors. These are the pain days. These are the pain days, we have congenitally missing central incisors. So this case could never be treated only by orthodontic treatment. And acceptance is not an option because it does affect aesthetics. So what we do is both orthodontic treatment to close some of the spaces and localize the space for future prosthetic replacement. So this is after treatment and the patient is old enough for implant or if she wants bridge, whatever the prosthetic option is. Now, if we talk about localized spaces, the most common etiological factors, hyperdontia, congenitally missing teeth, lost tooth due to trauma or extraction, 
lower free and upper free. We'll talk about each case. Actually, we're going to group these two together because the treatment options are almost the same. I will mention you already know the epidemiology looking at um, the Jordanian population and the Caucasian population. You already know the uh, distribution and the most common uh, teeth affected by hypodontia. So it's just important to know that mild cases usually one to two missing teeth, um, three to five missing teeth, moderate hypodontia, six teeth and more is oligodontia or severe hypodontia. Patients with missing central incisors, if a patient comes to your clinic with a missing central incisor, then most commonly this is due to no. trauma, mainly due to trauma. Fresh trauma now happened or trauma during the next dentition to the deciduous teeth, causing dilaceration or attachment, extraction, etc. Congenital missing is very rare, very rare for central incisors. So this is a case where the other right central incisor dilacerated very high near the nose cavity. So this is severe impaction and the only option is extraction. So you will end up with a missing central. Missing lateral incisors on the other hand most commonly due to habitantia, congenitally missing. Trauma, hmm, less common. So the first thing I think about is hypodontia. But at the end, we we'll end up with a missing tooth. So whether hypodontia or extraction or trauma, loss due to trauma, the end result is that I have a missing tooth. Treatment options, two main treatment options. I have to decide, should I close the spaces and camouflage the rest of the occlusion as if this tooth never existed? Or do I open space for a prosthetic replacement? This decision is very important and it is affected by multiple factors. The skeletal relationship of the malocclusion, smile line, crowding and spacing, so this is space condition, number of missing teeth, color and form of adjacent teeth in case I want to camouflage it to look like another tooth, this is important. Inclination of adjacent teeth because this will affect the type of tooth movement and the type of tooth movement will affect the type of appliance and the treatment duration. Desired proconsequence relationship at the end of the treatment. Patient pushes and cooperation is very important. And finally, long term maintenance and replacement of prosthesis. What am I going to do with the next step? The option of space closure. Usually, these are the features that favor the space closure, especially if I have missing upper incisors, citrals or laterals. Patients with a class 2 skeleton pattern, crowded arch in the upper arch, of course. Increased over jet, small canines with good matching color. When we say matching colors, it means matching the rest of the centrals that are there or, or laterals. So a canine that is not canineish in shape, that is not bulky, yellowish. No, this will not favor space closure. Okay. Class two buckle segment relationship more than half unit. So this is an example of a patient. One of the lateral incisors, microdontia, the upper left one, and the upper right one, congenitally missing. In addition, in the lower artery, this is complicated by congenitally missing second premolars. The patient has class 2 skeleton pattern and increased overjet. Missing second premolars, missing lateral on the right side and small lateral on the other side. Class 2 skeletal pattern, increased overjet. These two features favor space closure. So we decided to extract the lateral on this side and use the space to come up like the underlying skeletal pattern. Space closure, and this is the patient at the end of the treatment. And on the other hand, or, or maintaining it's already there, there are other features that favor space opening. Class 3 skeletal pattern or class 1, spaced arch, bulky dark canine, class 1 buccal segment or class 3. All these features favor space opening. Example, this patient here, she has congenitally missing upper right lateral incisor. She presented with mild, she presented with a class 1 malocclusion on mild class 3 skeletal pattern 
and the model relationship is class one. So all these features favor space opening the class three skeleton pattern, the class one model relationship, and the spaced arch. So the treatment is to open space here, localize all the spaces in open space for the missing lateral incisor. Actually, I open space and this lateral is a prosthetic one I added to the arch. This is a prosthetic one. Can you see? Yeah, yeah. so if this is a prosthetic one, center line spot on, good occlusion, overdue, overbite, everything looks good. So I take a radiograph to make sure that the roots are positioned properly for a future implant. So when I see better roots, that's it. This is, this is the end of my treatment. So I remove the appliance, and this is the SX, vacuum found SX for attention until the patient is ready for high prosthetic replacement. So there are different features that look at space opening or space closure. Now, to have a successful implant, there are certain criteria that I need to look at. The patient should be finished growth. So this is 18 years and above. Sometimes the uh, surgeons prefer 19, 20. You know, the older, the better, because some patients will have residual growth, and that will lead to vertical displacement of the implant. Adequate bone height and bone width and adequate space between the roots and between the crowns. All these features will give you a better success of your implant. Implant is not the only option, but we also have autotransplantation. Autotransplantation, that means I use an extra tooth that I don't need within the patient's arch or, or within the patient's mouth and then use it to fill a space of a missing tooth within the same patient's mouth. Autotransplantation. The advantage is biological replacement, so I don't need prosthesis, creates alveolar bone, has a natural periodontal membrane and better digital contour in theory. It can erupt in synchro and synchro and adjacent teeth if we use this technique in a growing patient where the root is not fully formed. This could be possible. Can be moved orthodontically once healing complete and it's suitable for a growing patient. I don't need to wait until the patient is above 18. I can do it with a growing patient. So this is an advantage. This advantage is only if a tooth plant for extraction because not every patient has an extra tooth. Not every patient has crowding. Increased burden of care and general anesthesia required for the procedure. Requires a skilled surgical technique. The surgical technique has to be as traumatic as possible to be successful, otherwise, we will have failures. Transplanted tooth may undergo resorption and ankylosis. Right. Criteria for successful autotransplantation. Root ideally, ideally, root development about two thirds to three fourths, not complete. Okay? Not a complete root. Two thirds to three fourths completed root only. Sufficient space in arch and occlusively accommodate the transplanted tooth, we, we prefer to put it out of occlusion so that we don't have occlusive forces against it. Careful preparation of the door inside with as atraumatic procedure as possible. Careful surgical technique of extraction. Transplanted tooth should be splinted 7 to 10 days and this should be followed by root canal treatment. This is not an ideal case, but this is the only case I have with auto transplantation. So this patient presented with, is of course, she's an adult patient who presented with a class one malocclusion complicated by multiple prospects and crowding. This was complicated by a missing upper left first premolar, right? Plus, we were surprised to have an extra premolar in the lower left quadrant, a supernumerary tooth. Guess what? Auto transplantation, why not? So we started with correction of the features of the malocclusion, correct, plus five, open space. So this is a space opening. Open space for uh, my, my, the donor space here. And then we make sure that the roots are parallel. There is enough space between the roots, enough space between the crowns. <laughs> and but by that time, the tooth was had a fed up and it actually erupted. So that was good because the, the extraction procedure was as traumatic as possible. So this tooth, extra tooth was extracted and it was inserted inside the donor site. 
and it was out of occlusion. This was followed by end of treatment, and of course, this should be followed also by maybe crowning, restorations, and, and the restorative uh, composite may be built up. Now, the last case of uh, localized spacing is median diastema. When we say diastema, it means the space between two adjacent teeth. It gets between the centrals, then this is median diastema. It's more common in the upper arch, it's more common in males, and it's more common in black ethnic groups. During the normal physiological stage, during the deciduous condition, it's normal to have spaced deciduous teeth. During the next condition, it's normal to have what we call ugly duckling stage, when the canines start to erupt, pushing against the lateral surface of the deciduous teeth, sorry, the, the, the distal surface of the lateral incisor, we will start to have flaring of teeth. And part of it is diastema. So this is normal. So if, it, if this is the case, then we have to reassure the patient that this is a normal physiological development. We don't need to provide any treatment. Another theological factor for median diastema is congenitally missing lateral incisor or small lateral incisors. Supernumerary tooth, like the mesodents, or maybe tuberculite, uh, tuberculite inside the bone, intrabony lesion or pathology, or to generalize the spacing, proclined upper incisors, or low upper frenal attachment. So, by maxillary proclination, both are proclined or low frenal attachment. To be able to properly diagnose a low frenal attachment, clinically, we could go with the Blanching test, where we have whitening in this area here, and we could add this with a very difficult to look at the vertical notch to make sure that actually the insertion of the fibers is inserted between both the central incisors. Management we always need to exclude supernumeraries. Any patient with median diastema, we take family history, we take great enough to exclude supernumeraries. If it's there, then extraction and monitor and reassess needed further treatment. If the patient is within the ugly duckling stage, as we said, reassure as long as the diastema 3 millimeters or less. But if it's more than that and it's really affecting patient's self-esteem, confidence levels, he's really bothered with it, then we can go with a simple treatment. Depending on the orientation of the central incisors, if they are upright or blurred distally, tipped distally, then we can provide the patient with a simple removal of lines to tip these teeth mesially. Simple removal of lines with belated finger springs. If the teeth were mesially tipped already, then we need bodily movement. That means the only option is fixed appliance. We need to be careful because the canine hadn't erupted yet. We don't want to compromise the roots of the centrals and the laterals against the erupting canine. If this in the permanent dentition, so if we have median diastema in the permanent dentition, if it's mild, then we encourage the patient to accept. If it's moderate and there is small T, then we can offer the patient restorations to build up. If it's more severe, sorry, if it's moderate and the size of the teeth is normal, then we can offer the patient tipping movement or fixed appliance based on the orientation of the tooth to start off with. Finally, severe cases, we need to offer both orthodontic treatment and restorative camouflage of the small teeth, because usually this is part of the etiology. What if the low phenal attachment is part of the etiology? What do we do? Well, there are three proposed times before treatment, orthodontic treatment, during or after. The best time is during or after, never before, because if you carry out the procedure before, you will end up with scar tissues and moving teeth across scar tissues is very difficult. So it's important to start closing, make sure that the patient is really complying, you're almost closing it and then you go with phrenectomy. This will actually build scar tissues around the new position and this will aid the attention. So timing of phrenectomy is important. Retention is extremely important to consider, especially if the patient has family history of diastema, you know, median diastema runs in the family. If the diastema is more than two millimeters at the start of the treatment, or if the arch was already spaced 
at the start of the treatment. These three cases really need to consider retention, permanent retention, long-term retention, bonded retainer. This is an example of a patient who suffered diastema bone, an immediate diastema, and the other, and then the lower arm. And because of the orientation of the knee, the only option was fixed appliance. So we closed the diastema, and of course, we, gave, we added bonded retainer for retention. So the asthma treatment to the asthma will depend on the severity, the age of the patient, and the dental development. This place team is part of the crowding, but I have to add a slide here just to tell you that this place team is not only due to lack of space, but there are other etiological factors. Abnormal position of the, of the tooth germ, the tension of deciduous teeth, for example, this canine here, there is a deciduous canine, so it was forced buccally. There's a deciduous canine, so we have some crowding, not because of the deciduous canine only, but because we have to decide our clean discrepancy. But it's part of the problem. It could be secondary to presence of supernumerary, or due to habit, or due to pathology. Whatever the etiology is, we need to go back to crowding, assessing of crowding, and deciding on extraction accordingly. Displaced teeth or crowded teeth, the same uh, treatment uh, strategy. Vertical problems. Vertical problems could exist in many types of malocclusions, but as I said, we're going to discuss it here because it's easier to discuss one dimension rather than uh, dimension anterior posterior problems as well. Vertical discrepancies is the lack of vertical overlap between the upper and the lower incisors. The anterior open bite, usually due to skeletal problems, and this is related to posterior growth rotation, increased lower facial height, increased maxillomandibular plane angle, Frankfurt mandibular plane angle, and general increased vertical proportions of the face. It could be due to soft tissues like indigenous tongue thrust or exogenous tongue thrust, adaptive swallowing pattern, or incompetent lips. Of course, incompetent lips will lead to bimaxillary proclination, and proclination will lead to reduction of overbite, vertical overlap, maybe up to the extent that we have anterior elbow bite. Of course, it could be due to habits, thumb sucking habit, and the severity will depend on the duration, intensity, Usually, it is asymmetric and it is associated with the serial prospect. You already covered that with, your, with the local factors and soft tissue factors. Localized failure of development, like a cleft liver palate patients, or mouth breathing, where we have little evidence to support this. Now, what is the management of anterior open bite? Again, anterior open bite is a little bit difficult, so we need to look at the etiology. We need to plan this case carefully. If the case is in the midst dentition and it is related to thumb sucking habit, then it's extremely important to stop the habit first and maybe add um, uh, habit breaker, fixed habit breaker, or removable appliance to start expansion. And that could reverse most of the features except for the crossbite. If thumb sucking habit existed in the permanent dentition, again, we need to stop the habit first, but the treatment of the features of the malocclusion should follow a comprehensive treatment plan and usually fix the clients plus minus expansion. If the problem is in the permanent addition and it's mild, then again, I need to encourage the patient to accept, especially if you have persistent poor oral hygiene, not, not compliant patients, not a satisfied patient with his occlusion, he has no problem with his occlusion. Um, or persistent habits, the patient does, is, is not willing to give up his thumb sucking habit or indigenous thumb thrust. If this is the case, we need to encourage the patient to have no treatment. If the patient is still growing, then the patient is usually following a vertical pattern of growth, posterior growth of rotation. So maybe we need to keep the patient under brief observation to look and assess growth pattern for this patient. In mild cases, we could go with extrusion of labial segment plus minus intrusion of the buccal segment, but favorably or ideally we go with the intrusion of the buccal segment using hyper head gear or fixed appliance techniques, buccal capping with removal of functional appliances, 
the pulling magnets, which is not that common nowadays, temporary anchorage devices, which is the main screws that we use in orthodontics. In moderate cases that is associated with anterior posterior problems, especially class two problems, we could use functional appliance plus hyper headgear or bite blocks to control the vertical dimension. If bimaxillary crowding and proclination exist, and there is crowding as well, then we might consider extraction and retroclination of the upper and the lower incisors. Retroclination will affect the vertical dimension. It will increase it. So this might be the answer of the anterior open bite. Severe skeletal open bite, we should always consider orthognathic surgery. So this is an, an example of a patient, normal vertical proportions, class one, malocclusion, complicated by anterior open bite. Why? Normal vertical proportions. By maxillary proclination. Can you see here the upper and lower teeth? By maxillary proclination. Looking intraorally, the decision in addition to the crowding, so this is a case of biomax crowding anterior open bite. Extraction of both sixes in the lower arch, the six in the upper left quadrant, and the five because this is a failed end of three to two. Extraction of the five on this side, fixed up lines upper and lower, closure of space, control vertical dimension, and this is the patient at the end of the tree. So we didn't think of orthognathic surgery because the patient has normal vertical proportions. So the, the answer is dentary. Let's compare this to the other this with the previous case. Do you think this is more severe? Etiology. Skeletal. This is a huge vertical proportion. Posterior growth rotation, increased lower facial power, increased vertical proportion in terms of maxillary ventral plane angle, frankfurt ventral plane angle. This is a skeletal, we call it a skeletal upper part. Full stop, this is not dental. So the only treatment to offer is orthognathic surgery. So we start with fixed appliances to arch coordinate, close some of the spaces, and then this is the patient at the end of the orthognathic surgery. So the treatment, we need to understand why this happened, we need to understand the etiology, and then plan our treatment accordingly. Now we will come to a problem in the transverse dimension, which we call crossbite. Crossbite is usually a discrepancy in the local lingual relationship. You need to answer four questions for any crossbite in the battle segment. Is it lingual, which we call it scissor, or is it buckle? And this is based on the lower buckle cusps. If the lower buccal cusp is more buccal to its normal position, we call it buccal crossbite. If it's more lingual to its normal position, we call it lingual crossbite or scissor bite. The other question is, is it unilateral or bilateral? Is it localized to few teeth or is it generalized to a whole segment? With or without mandibular displacement? Any unilateral crossbite, you should think about mandibular displacement. Bilateral crossbite is less common to have a mandibular displacement. So this is the normal transverse relationship. This here is buccal crossbite because the lower is more buccal to its normal position. And this is because the lower is more lingual to its position. Why do we call it scissor bite? What do you mean like a scissor? They cross each other. They bypass each other. There is no contact. Like the scissors, they bypass each other. There is no contact. So if I look at the buccal crossbar and the lingual crossbar, which one is more functionally demanding treatment? Scissor bite, scissor lingual bite, so? So basically, if I have a bilateral buccal crossbar without mandibular displacement, I could accept. Sometimes I could accept a lingual crossbar where we have no occlusal function. We need to consider treatment. 
transverse discrepancy, as we said, it could be local factors related to local crowding, severe displacement of a single tooth. So, for example, this one is a crossbite. It could be related to skeletal problems, like, for example, narrow maxilla plus minus wide mandible, or the opposite. So, it is related to the skeletal discrepancy in the transverse dimension. And usually, if this is the case, you will find that the teeth are upright or normal orientation, and the problem is in the skeletal uh, part of the arch. It could be due to soft tissue and habits. Some sucking habits, if you remember, will cause the tongue to go up, and we will have, we will sort of to go down, and we will lose our balancing zone, and we will end up with an aromaxilla. So it could be due to habits. Rare causes, flexible and palate uh, cases, pathology or trauma. Now, the treatment will depend on the severity, will depend on the classification, will depend on the teeth involved, and if it's skeletal or dental. Usually, cases with a single tooth uh, in crossbite, simple tipping movement is enough if it's not that severe. With a removable appliance, I could add what active component? T spring. If it's in the anterior segment, Z spring, right? If I have few teeth, two or more than two teeth, double cantilever in the anterior segment, in the posterior segment, expansion screws, localized to the, for example, if I have here six, five, and four, then I have to cut it here and have my expansion screw only for this clock of teeth. Expansion screw for only the affected side. Or I can use plus elastics, plus elastics, uh, elastic that runs from the related surface of the upper buccal teeth, upper molars, to the uh, buccal uh, surface of the lower, from the related surface of the upper to the buccal surface of the lower, and this will correct the single tooth in buccal crossbar. So this is an example of a patient, class 1 malocclusion, complicated by crossbar affecting both upper canine and the lateral incisor. So this is the patient at the end of the treatment, correction of the cross bite. If the problem is affected, affecting a whole segment, for example, unilateral buccal cross bite, I need to think, what's the etiology? If it's dental, then easy, I can go with tipping movement. Upper removal appliance with midline expansion screw will do the job. Simple tipping movement. Midline expansion screw, usually buccal capping, and we can actually tip these teeth. So the, the width of the art is normal. So there is no skeletal etiology. And we have problem dentally. We tip the teeth, we correct the prospect. If I need more than four millimeter of expansion, or if the problem is part of its skeletal, and the teeth are upright or normal inclination, and tipping movement will not solve the problem, then I need to think of bodily movement what we call slow expansion appliance, like the quad helix. It's a fixed appliance that is used for expansion. Most of the movement is bodily, in theory, and the rest is tipping movement. So this is a quad helix. It is called the quad helix because I have four helices. It is fixed, and I can activate it to produce more than four millimeters and help for uh, bodily movement. If the case is more skeletal and I need to modify the skeletal pattern transversely, then I need to think about rapid maxillary expansion. Since I have slow, most probably I have rapid. We call it RPE -R -R -E or RNE, rapid lethal expansion or rapid maxillary expansion. This appliance should be used in patients who are younger than 15 years old because I need the mid suture surgery to be still open, not fused. Okay. And the idea is resembling what we call distraction osteogenesis, where I have a suture that I open and hope for a new bone to develop and form within the suture. Usually the patient has to open this, of course it is fixed, uh, the rapid breathing expression is fixed. It could be capping with a banded, not bonded. The patient should activate it twice a day, twice a day. Removal appliance, once to twice a week. Quad helix activated by the, uh, the clinician himself. Okay? But rapid clinical expansion is activated by the patient twice a day. 
for two weeks. Each turn, quarter millimeter. So each day, half millimeter. 14 days, seven millimeters, right? Mm -hmm. So I expect seven millimeter of expansion within two weeks. After that, this should be followed by several months of retention after I achieve the correction. And it is advised to go for over correction. So this applies is supposed to give me skeletal modification, but actually part of it is going to be bodily and sometimes tipping movement. It's not available. It could be part of the treatment. So this is an example of a patient. This is my, we call it black corridors. Black corridors is usually associated with a patient with narrow maxilla, bilateral buccal crossbite. Bilateral buccal crossbite should not be treated by the general dentist with simple removal appliance. Never, because if you fail, you will transfer the patient from a non-functioning case that requires treatment to a case with unilateral crossbite and mandibular displacement. Because as we said, bilateral crossbite is stable. In terms of function, in terms of temporary mandibular joint, it's stable, no problem. No functional need. But if you fail to treat it fully, it will be converted to unilateral crossbite with mandibular displacement. So this should be treated by the orthodontist using fixed appliances, bodily movement to correct the crossbite. You can see part of the black corridor was corrected, non-extraction, expansion, and bilateral crossbite was corrected as well. Now the last clinical case is the bimaxillary proclination. Bimaxillary proclination, we talked about the etiology, if you remember. The etiology is mainly soft tissues, incompetent lips, flaccid lips, low tonicity, everted. Okay, and it is very difficult to treat because if you don't remove the etiology, it will relapse. Can I remove a flaccid lips? Low tonicity? Maybe incompetent lips could be treated, maybe. Uh, maybe crowding could be treated, and this will help with the retraction of the teeth. But I need to be very careful with the retention. So these cases are difficult to treat. You need to plan it carefully. Usually it's common in Afro Caribbean. Although the incisor relationship is a plus one, but the overjet is increased due to the inclination of the upper and the lower incisor. Management, as I said, is difficult because of the relapse, because the teeth are in, in, in the balance uh, zone was uh, disturbed. The tongue is winning, teeth are pushed by the tongue. If you don't correct this, then you need to consider permanent retention, otherwise it will relapse. If it's mild, we need to encourage the patient to accept again because of the problem of relapse. Stability, as I said, is a problem. And lips, if we start on incompetent lips, then we have better prognosis. Because if we achieve competent lips at the end, this will aid for stability. Crowding and spacing will affect the type of appliance used and the retention after treatment. This is an example of a patient. This is a patient presented with a class 1 mild occlusion complicated by bimaxillary proclination, right? But this patient has nearly normal lips, a little bit of strain with hair and ties muscle to close, so she has nearly incompetent lips, but they are of normal thickness. Plus, we have crowding. So treatment for this patient should have good prognosis. Why? Extraction, retroclination of the upper and the lower segment, and we expect a more relaxed soft tissues. So this is extraction of a premolar in each quadrant, space closure, arch co coordination, and this is at the end of the treatment. So you can see her smiling much better, and you can see her profile much relaxed. Now she has competent lips. Now this will aid for the stability of the treatment. So these were different cases, but does that mean that when I have a case, she, it will have only one problem? We can have cases that has multiple problems. Yeah, a patient with a class one malocclusion complicated by by maxillary proclamation. All agree? Yes. No. Okay. You will have actually you will have 
and it will give me more space to replace the missing lateral incisor. Final to reproclination, anterior open pipe, cross pipe, and localize the spacing in the same patient, all in one. So this is the patient in the middle of the treatment. Of course, the correction of the anterior open pipe was a combination of a little bit of extrusion of the anterior teeth and a little bit of intrusion of the posterior teeth. And this is a prosthetic lateral. I usually add it, especially in females, because with a gap, they are not satisfied. And they will rush you into treatment. They say, when am I going to finish? Right? Every visit. So it's easier to go with a prosthetic lateral. I add it to the art fire, and then the patient will be quiet for a few visits. They will not ask when they're going to finish. I make sure that I have a parallel roots, and then I go for I, I go with the deboned. This is the essence with the prosthetic lateral, and now the patient is ready for any future implant or a prosthetic replacement, fixed or removable, right? Any question about class one malocclusion? 